Harvard Delphio, Ockman Klein, Internet Work, Sabe, Park Center,
우리 사회와 경제 곳곳에서 인공지능이 적용되고 있습니다. 바보들의 약간은 그동안 전 세계에서 발표된 아까 말씀하셨는데요. 상당히 많은 36개의 인공지능 윤리 원칙을 목표로 해서 인공지능과 함께 발전했던 인공지능 윤리학 지원도 원칙에 기반한 인공지능 보고서라고 하는 이름으로 연구 성과를 발표를 했습니다. 그 연구 성과가 바로 지난 주에 발표됐다고 합니다. 이것은 전 세계에서 처음으로 공개적으로 발표를 한 것으로 알고 있고요. 그러한 기회를 우리 법선은 데이터스톨에서 갖게 되어서 큰 영광입니다. 또한 2017년부터는 인공지능의 현재 모습, 모습인 기계학습이 발전함에 따라서 가장 중요한 훈련용 데이터의 확보가 수반하게 되는 문제가 발생하게 됐습니다. 바로 프라이버시 문제죠. 이 프라이버시 문제는 GDPR, 유럽 사람들이죠. GDPR에서 알고 있는 것을 알고 있는데 우리나라도 1월 9일 GDPR을 벤치마킹할 개인정보 개정안이 통과되었으나 시민단체들이 여러 문제를 제기하고 있는 상황이라고 볼 수가 있습니다. 오늘 이 컨퍼런스를 통해서 GDPR의 모습을 객관적인 시각에서 검토하여 앞으로 우리 새로운 개인정보 보호법이 어떻게 집행되고 해석해야 되는가에 대해서 중요한 그 자료를 우리가 가졌으면 좋겠습니다. 오늘 외국에서 오신 버그맨 센터, 네트워크 업 센터, 디지털 에이저 허브, 그리고 사단법인 오픈넷 관계자들께 감사드리고요. 오늘 오신 청년 모든 분들께 또 감사드립니다. 다음 주가 서울이죠. 서울 행복하게 계시고 추운 겨울 건강하게 지내시기 바랍니다. 감사합니다. 네, 다음으로는 공동 주최자 중에서 네트워크 오브 센터의 문영이랑 안영이신 어, 오늘 토론회에 있었던 카로스 아폰소 대수장님께서 어, 네트워크 센터스를 위해서 어, 환영사 짧게 해주시겠습니다. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Alonso. I am uh, part of the executive committee of the Uh, International Society Research Centers Network, the NLC. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here with this kind of invitation at Korea, Korea University and to be among friends uh, to discuss issues related to AI, ethics, uh, and data protection. Uh, very briefly, some words on, on the NLC. So, the network of centers. It was uh, a network. It is a network that was created back in 2011, uh, kickstarted by the Brooklyn Blind Center at Harvard University, having with its goal the idea to connect different centers throughout the world who are doing uh, cutting edge uh, research on the interplay between law, information technology, social sciences to make sure that we can connect the best research that we've been doing in the world. But at that time, we felt there was some lack of coordination in order to make sure that we could provide to the academic community a way in which different centers from different parts of the world could connect and produce and create joint research projects. So that was the idea, the initiative uh, of the network being created back in 2011. 
2011. Nowadays, the network has more than 100 research centers on all continents, and uh, I really have to say that it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor uh, K.S. Park being uh, an active member of the, of the network and, and, and putting uh, Korea on the map on those centers that provides uh, uh, a lot of very interesting research on issues that connect clearly to a global debate on certain issues of artificial intelligence, uh, data protection and, and privacy. And the idea of the network for the forthcoming years is to delve deep on the research on artificial intelligence, making sure that we are able to provide a very strong voice on how certain keywords are important to the future of uh, artificial intelligence research, such as inclusion. The network has uh, hosted events in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, uh, back in 2017, uh, having more than uh, 200 researchers on artificial intelligence going down to Brazil to make uh, this connection on these, on these events. And after that, a lot of events have been uh, moving forward with the agenda on issues related to AI and inclusion. And we see this event, this gathering uh, here in Seoul today, as another step in this, in this direction, in which we have uh, representatives from different centers of the network here. And uh, please count on us. If you have questions uh, on the network, if you want to know more uh, about the network and how can you connect to the research that we have been doing in the past, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, but in the, the meantime, I just have to say, if you want to take a look on uh, some of the, our recent developments on this field, please take a look on the, on the website aiandinclusion.org. So artificial intelligence and inclusion, AI and inclusion.org, there you see a little bit of what the network has been doing on the issues of uh, artificial and artificial intelligence. And I think for me that's it. I just have to say that it's a great, great pleasure to be here, to be here in Seoul among friends, and I have great expectations of the conversation that we're going to have throughout the day. Thank you.
sure that it will have a positive impact on the world. Um, we believe that the research demonstrates that the, despite all the public chatter and concern about the lack of vision for ethical artificial intelligence, there is an emerging consensus around certain key themes that will form a foundation for building and using this technology in a way that is ethical and respects human rights. So during this talk, which will be about half an hour, I'll walk you through the methodology um, that we used to create the report, how to read this data visualization, um, and then share our key findings around each of the themes. So there are 36 total documents in our data set. We looked at dozens of documents um, before settling on these 36. And it's worth noting that 36 is just a subset of the number of AI principles documents that are out there. There are certain other organizations, like Algorithm Watch, uh, that are tracking all of the documents um, that present principles for AI. You can find those on their website. What we were striving for was uh, a sort of small sample um, that would allow us to um, that would be small enough to allow us to create that data visualization and to really process um, the contents of all of the documents, but be broad enough um, to include sort of many of the most significant or influential documents, um, as well as diversity of the documents across geographies, stakeholders, time, um, focus area, and more. Um, so you can see that uh, some of the, the variation in geography and entity types. Um, it was not a requirement that the document use the word principles, so there are some documents in the data set that don't use the word principles. Instead, we were focused on documents that advanced uh, a normative general statement about how AI ought to be developed, uh, deployed, and its usage regulated. Um, so this um, definition notably excludes descriptive statements about AI risks and benefits, um, which unfortunately excludes many of the white papers, very valuable white papers, released by others in the academic community. Um, so here's just a chart um, showing that data about um, geographical representation in a slightly different way. Um, you can see at a glance that the US and Europe predominate. Um, and that's partly due to engagement with by the national governments in those areas, um, but I think especially due to the location of um, tech and, um, and telco companies that have produced these principles in those areas. Um, also probably due to some degree to the membership of the research team, um, we tried to develop a team that had as broad language skills as possible, so we had Spanish, French, German, and Chinese speakers. Um, however, all but one of us were based during the time of the authorship in the Northeast US, uh, and that affects our professional networks and the documents um, that we were most aware of. Unfortunately, um, we were not able to find any documents from the continent of Africa that met our definition of AI principles, although we are aware um, anecdotally that a couple of national governments um, in Sub-Saharan Africa may be working on um, national um, AI plans that may include those principles in the future. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, so we were much um, more successful, if you go to the next slide, in. Um, ensuring the diversity of stakeholders, um, which along with geographical diversity was key to us because it was a sort of what we expected might be a key access of difference um, between the principles documents that we were looking at. Um, it was our expectation that a private sector entity might have a very different set of um, uh, goals for their AI principles document than, for example, an advocacy group from civil society or a national government. Um, so you can see governments predominate. Um, the next largest group is private sector, multi-stakeholder organizations, which frequently included both government um, and um, private sector alongside academics and civil society members. Um, and then that intergovernmental chunk um, are um, the uh, OECD, and includes the OECD and G20 principles that came out in the last um, year. Um, so this is another visualization that just shows you a timeline of the documents that we included, um, starting in 2016 um, with the tenets of the um, Partnership on AI, a membership organization um, focused on ethical artificial intelligence. Um, and then going through to the last document on the far right um, is IBM's um, AI principles that were published in October of 2019. Um, so Final notes on sort of what went in and what came out. Um, we only included documents that were um, generally applicable to AI technology. We did not.
not include documents that focus only on a specific type of AI technology, like um, facial recognition or autonomous vehicles. But we did include documents that um, looked generally at AI technology, but focused on its application in a specific sector, such as the judicial system or um, financial um, regulation. Um, we also excluded um, regulation and legislation. Um, the most significant piece of that that we um, had under consideration was a Canadian regulation um, which governs government acquisition of AI technologies and use of AI technologies. Um, but because the process for passing regulation is so much different than um, creating this kind of gray paper material, which makes up most of the rest of um, the body of uh, our data, that we didn't think it was appropriate. Um, okay, so now that you know a little bit more about the documents and the data set, we can go to the next slide and um, uh, return to the sort of larger visualization. So it's a little um, bright, so it's hard to see, um, but every spoke of the document represents, or of, this, of the visualization, represents one of those principles documents that we just discussed, um, and they're color-coded by sector. Um, so the yellow ones are civil society, the pink ones are private sector, um, blue are multi-stakeholder, orange are intergovernmental, uh, green are government. Um, and then each of the rings of the visualization is one of the themes that we've covered. And the size of the circle at the intersection of the spoke and the ring represents the depth of coverage for that theme in that document. Um, if any of you have your laptops and you're having trouble seeing on the screen, the report is available at cyber.harvard.edu um, if you want to download it um, and look um, on, on your own screen as, as we follow along. Um, so here you can probably see them a little more easily are the eight themes. We arrived at these eight themes by hand coding all of the principles in a large subset of the documents that were included in the final visualization collating duplicates that we found, and then grouping like principles together. Um, so some people look at these themes and find them very intuitive, and sometimes when I read um, media reports and other analysis of ethical AI, I'm really struck by how many of these words just sort of come up um, organically um, in that analysis. Other people have looked at them and had frustrations. So um, one comment that we've gotten um, to some degree is um, there are people who would like to see a greater um, prominence for, for example, environmental sustainability among these themes. Now, we do see environmental sustainability-related re principles, for example, um, in environmental impact under the accountability theme and um, under the promotion of human values theme. Um, but because we source these themes in a very bottom-up way from the principles that we observed in the documents that are part of our data set, um, even though those of us on the research team um, really acknowledge the importance of environmental sustainability for AI, particularly given the processing power required, um, it just it didn't rise to the level of the theme. Um, so uh, we can actually skip two slides. There we go. Um, so this uh, is um, a little screen cap of the bottom left of the visualization, which shows you the principles um, that are under each of the themes. Um, so note that um, not every theme has the same number of principles. Um, promotion of human values and human control of technology have the fewest principles. Um, and I think accountability has the most of 11. Um, so uh, each theme is a sort of cluster of, of closely related um, thematic principles. Um, next slide. I'll also note, um, you may have seen when you were looking at the visualization, the outermost ring didn't have dots, it had these other shapes, the diamond and the um, star. In addition to the eight themes, we collected information on documents references to human rights. Um, so we collected information on whether they referenced the phrase human rights, or um, reference any recognized international instrument of human rights, such as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights or the ICCPR. Um, and then we also collected um, information on whether the document explicitly stated that it emerged from a human rights framework. Um, so in the visualization, you see um, diamonds for documents that reference human rights or an instrument thereof, and stars for the ones uh, that do that and also um, explicitly state that they follow from a human rights framework. All right, 
so with that sort of basic setup on the visualization and um, our methodology, um, let's jump into the key themes and start to sort of dig a little bit deeper um, into the principles that contain um, that are contained in them and um, some of our key findings. And I think that this area is particularly interesting because um, as compelling as it is to know that there are these key themes to the conversation about ethical AI, um, there is a large gap between having a word like privacy and actually creating technology that is respectful of privacy. And some of that work happens in the different articulations of what privacy means um, in these individual documents. So the privacy theme is covered in 97% of documents. Um, and then if it's dark enough for you to see, um, on this slide you can see that there are um, percentages next to each of the principles that are listed, um, and that's the percentage of documents that cover that specific principle. Um, privacy is especially important to AI because um, it is relevant both at the training stage. Um, a, most AI technologies today require a lot of data um, to be developed. Um, and so the consent of people whose data is included in that process um, is important. Most AIs also need data in order and information about individuals in order to be run once they've been deployed and implemented. Um, and so privacy is relevant both at the development stage and after a technology is already in use. Um, it's also one of the areas, one of the thematic areas in which the human rights framework um, is most commonly brought to bear on ethical AI because privacy um, is a widely, widely recognized as a human right in most of the relevant instruments. Um, and um, furthermore, it's relevant to um, domestic law, for example, the GDPR, which I know um, was very influential also um, in the recent Korean legislation that was enacted um, and has been similarly influential around the world. Um, you see specific provisions of the GDPR um, reflected in um, uh, principles like, um, which is here, the right to erasure, uh, which is a right that exists. Is that a little better? You can see better? Good. You can't see me, but you can see the slides. So that's important. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you, you see specific um, provisions of the GDPR reflected in some of these privacy principles, although in the case of the right to erasure, it's in two documents, um, both European documents. Um, so another thing that you see here, um, that's sort of well reflected in the privacy principles is the varying depth with which um, different documents um, uh, address the theme. So I um, was lucky enough to get to meet Dean on this morning, um, and he asked about um, how, uh, uh, how in-depth the coverage um, of these different documents were. Um, were, they, um, were they two or three pages? Were they very long? Um, and I said, yes. They were both. You know, some of them are short, as short as like a single blog post that would fit on one page. Others are literally books, um, and um, that's reflected, I think, in the in the types of principles that um, that documents will have for, for example, privacy. Um, so you see that the, the single most popular principle in the entire data set was a sort of general privacy principle, the importance of of, of AI to privacy. Um, that's obviously happening at a very high level. Um, sort of one level down from that, you might have a principle like um, consent, um, which was also very popular, not quite as popular. Um, and then even more specific than consent, but very much within the same theme, is something like the right to restrict processing. So that's consent to a specific action. Um, so I, can, I sort of think of those three, general privacy, consent, uh, and then the right to restrict processing, like a funnel um, of additional specificity. And we see that type of pattern replicated over and over again in the data. So um, we can move to the next theme, which is accountability. Actually, uh, just just, yes. just to enhance uh, user experience, yeah. which is all this is about. Uh, uh, 저기 처음에 말씀 안 저희가 보시면 자료집을 안 만들어 드렸습니다. 저희가 uh, 정책적으로 환경 보호를 위해서 uh, 프린트 하지 않고. 어, 홈페이지, 오픈넷 홈페이지에 가시면 오픈넷, 오픈넷 or.kr입니다. o p e n n e t o r k r 에서 가서 공지 메뉴에 가시면 공지 메뉴에 가시면 
프레젠테이션이라는 제목으로 영어로 프레젠테이션이라는 제목으로 포스팅이 어, 있는데 거기 가시면은 지금 화면에 보시는 발표문들을 다운받아서 어, 여러분들 디바이스로 어, 보실 수가 있습니다. 어, 오픈넷 오픈넷 닷 오알 닷 KR 공지 메뉴 그리고 프레젠테이션 포스팅 가면은 어, 저희가 가지고 있는 모든 발제문과 모든 토론문을 다 다시 다 다운로드 받아서 보실 수가 있습니다. Uh, so we uploaded that to uh, so that if they cannot see very well, they can just download that yeah. with their devices. Okay, we can continue. Okay, uh, thank you. And I'm also happy to take questions at the end if there was anything earlier in the presentation uh, that you missed. Uh, so accountability was another highly prevalent theme mentioned in um, all but one of the documents. Worth noting that actually the only document that left it out um, was a telecommunications company, Telefonica, um, which was the most highly ranked company in the ranking digital rights um, uh, survey of last year and has other accountability mechanisms, but didn't specifically include them in their AI principles. So um, the term accountability itself is actually um, comes up in uh, almost 70% of the documents. Um, accountability is relevant, um, much as privacy is, across an AI's life cycle. Um, and here we think about it really in terms of three stages of accountability. One is planning for accountability at the design stage, for example, doing impact assessments, uh, which was a very popular uh, individual principle. Um, we also think about, yeah, once, it, once the design has been complete and the um, system is in use, monitoring, for example, evaluation and auditing requirements. And then finally, in the event that the earlier stages of accountability fail and harm actually occurs, the final stage would be redress. Um, for example, um, the liability and legal responsibility um, principle that we see here. There are strong connections between the accountability theme and the safety and security and human control of technology theme. Um, with numerous documents <coughs> emphasizing the importance of human oversight. There's also a recognition that there are existing accountability systems, such as tort law, um, which may help to ensure accountability, although they may need um, to uh, be revised somewhat in light of the particular characters of AI technology. Um, so the next theme is safety and security. Um, this is quite a common theme. We see it in 81% of documents, um, and there's widespread importance of the uh, widespread acceptance of the importance of these con concepts, um, presumably because of uh, news stories like fatal crashes of autonomous vehicles, um, ep epidemics of disinformation that are fed by um, algorithmic content moderation um, technologies, etc. And uh, a number of documents specifically acknowledge the importance of safety and security in AI in um, securing public trust, um, which will be key to the future of the technology. So um, why do we say safety and security? Why not pick one or the other? Um, so uh, at least in English, when we use the word safety, we think about safe systems as functioning properly and avoiding unintended harms. By contrast, so that's very much like an internal Concept. By contrast, when we think about security, um, we think about secure systems that resist external threats. So um, safety is internally focused and security is externally focused. Um, they are both important at the design stage, um, but re remain of continued concern we see in the principles documents after an AI system is in use, um, with calls under safety to continue running safety tests, um, even when uh, systems have passed those set tests at the design stage, um, and under security for mechanisms to share information um, between um, relevant parties about vulnerabilities or emerging security threats. Great. Um, so transparency and explainability. Um, principles of this theme were mentioned in 94% of documents. Um, and these are a particularly challenging, important set of concepts, um, both because AI technology is, or is at least frequently perceived to be, complex and opaque, um, also because it has already proven difficult to know, for example, um, in the US and the criminal justice con context, um, when an algorithm, al algorithmic system is or is not in use. Um, the key question is often around the level of information or transparency required. 
Um, so and in explainability, we think of this as the translation of technical concepts and decision outputs into comprehensible formats. How comprehensible does that have to be? Can it be comprehensible enough for a specially trained technician to be able to understand what the AI is doing? Do we want it to be translatable to the point where expert policymakers can understand it? Um, or are we really looking for explainability vis-a-vis -vis the general public? Um, in tr the transparency context, um, we sometimes see transparency requirements just around the technology itself, um, but the sort of increasing stage is not just um, uh, just around transparency of the technology, but also business model transparency around the uses of the technology. And we see that reflected in particular uh, in a, a very comprehensive AI principles document that the European Commission's um, high-level expert group on artificial intelligence reported. Uh, so they called for being explicit and open about choices and decisions concerning data sources, development processes, <coughs> and stakeholders. Uh, so uh, another interesting thing that we notice about this theme is that some of the principles within it are, are really new to AI technology, like explainability, um, but many of them are very familiar to those of us um, who have been um, following technology governance with regard to other technologies, um, such as regular reporting, which of course uh, has been a significant issue with regard to tech companies' um, uh, disclosure of requests for information from governments. Uh, so the next slide is fairness and non-discrimination. Um, this was actually the single most covered theme um, among the documents we looked at. 100% of the documents um, in our data set include a principle under the fairness and non-discrimination theme. It's widely recognized in the documents as particularly important to marginalized populations. Um, and they recognize that there is a risk of both scaling um, existing discrimination, which I think is quite common in the documents, as well as a few of them acknowledge the possibility that AI um, could introduce novel types of discrimination and that we need to be on guard for that. So we see that, for example, um, in the principles document that the Singapore Monetary Authority released. Um, bias creeps into AI in many ways. Um, and, and one thing that's been very popular um, in the press to talk about is sort of bad data, biased data unrepresentative or flawed data. Um, however, there are numerous other um, factors. For example, the choice um, by developers of imperfect proxies for the outcomes of interest, um, as well as the use of um, systems that are designed for one output in a different context, or designed for use with one population tested on a certain population in a different population. Um, we see some documents that exclusively emphasize the bad data issue, um, but others that have take a very broad um, look at fairness and non-discrimination and perhaps focus less on the technology and more um, on the effects of the technology when it is used. An example of that is the Toronto Declaration, um, which is uh, um, signed onto by a number of civil society groups but was led by Amnesty International and Access Now. Um, so, Another interesting thing about this topic is that while we see terms like fairness, equality, um, and the avoidance of discrimination, um, there is not a lot of material on the specific definitions of those terms. They remain fairly high level goals. Um, and that's particularly concerning um, going forward because um, when you look at the machine learning literature, for example, there was a great paper at the um, FAT conference in 2018 um, called 21 Definitions of Fairness, which showed um, from computer science literature 21 separate definitions of fairness, most of which are incompatible with each other. So if you pick one, you can't have other types of fairness. Um, that um, we have this unique opportunity with AI um, to sort of put this decision making on the table to make the decisions about which type of fairness is most important to us, um, but it's not something um, that we've made a great deal of progress um, toward. Uh, so, um, another fun, sort of final note about fairness and non-discrimination, uh, connecting back um, to the Network of Centers theme on AI inclusiveness, um, we see um, actually quite prevalent calls for um, both inclusiveness in the design process, so building more diverse teams to create these technologies, as well as emphasis on um, inclusiveness in the impact of the technologies. Um, so human control.
control of technology, or on theme um, six of eight, um, is present in 69% of the documents, um, and can actually be seen, interestingly, as a control or implementation mechanism for um, some of the other themes, principles, and some of the other themes, such as safety and security, transparency and explainability, fairness and non-discrimination, even the promotion of human values. Um, and there are a range um, from ex-ante um, sort of controls for human control of technology, such as um, uh, opt-out um, abilities, to ex-post um, uh, solutions like human review of algorithmic decisions that are challenged. Um, we also see language about um, fail-safes, either through continuous monitoring, so an obligation if you're running an AI system to have humans continually monitoring it in case something goes wrong, or design um, mechanisms that enable the um, automatic transfer of control um, from the uh, AI system back to humans in the event that certain conditions are triggered. Um, in one document, a public voice document, uh, public voice coalition document, we even see um, an obligation to terminate an AI uh, that human no longer humans no longer control. Um, so uh, also a range here from um, concerns about sort of present day AI technology and how humans should exert control over it to sort of future thinking about as we move toward um, artificial general intelligence, um, how human control should um, continue to be relevant. Um, also interesting here that we see some different um, articulations of the reason that human control is important. Um, this is another place where we see um, uh, reasoning around the importance of building trust in AI technology and the importance of having humans sort of in the loop to promote that trust. Um, but you also see much more um, abstract justifications such as the respect for human autonomy. Um, professional responsibility is next. Um, so this is in 78% of the documents. Principles in this theme are targeted at the unique responsibilities of principal, of people whose jobs it, it, job it is to design, implement, and manage AI systems. Um, so uh, the French um, national strategy document, for example, says that professionals have to use these responsible design um, skills because regulation lags. So um, particularly in, when we, we're dealing with emerging technology like this, um, if the government can't keep up, it's really the role of professionals who are in this space um, to ensure that the technologies that they build or the technologies that they decide to use um, are ethical and respect human rights. Uh, so uh, one of the most popular um, principles under this theme is multi-stakeholder collaboration, um, which I think connects back to that um, principle in fairness and non-discrimination about um, inclusivity in the design process. So multi-stakeholder collaboration includes calls for um, design teams to really reach out broadly to affected communities and include them, or at least source information from them, um, to make decisions about how the technology should be built and used. Um, we also see uh, long-term effects in this category, um, which sort of connects back to human control of technology and concerns about um, how to manage AI over time as it gets um, increasingly powerful. The final theme is the promotion of human values, um, which is mentioned in 69% of documents, um, and says that um, the purposes of AI systems and the means of their implementation should be strongly influenced by social norms, um, especially due to their potential to scale. Um, we also see here a strong connection to the human rights. So we, in a number of documents, observe those two phrases actually directly relevant, directly adjacent to one another, um, human values and human rights. Um, something that was really interesting to look at is documents that focus on human values in the design of systems. So for example, um, our document from the Middle East is a document from Smart Dubai um, that says that we should give AI systems human values and make them beneficial to society. Uh, that's really interesting because some of the literature about machine learning in particular has suggested that it's very challenging um, to give a machine learning system any type of values or higher level reasoning. Um, they're really just sort of um, statistical machines. Uh, and um, other documents, such as the uh, European Commission's High Level Expert Group, 
emphasize that the effects of AI systems are what should align with human values. Um, so um, both challenges in their own way, managing the effects versus managing the design, um, but two very different approaches. Um, yeah, good, okay. Um, all right, well, I will wrap it up there. Um, so we can go to the last slide. Um, thank you to all of you for listening, and I really look forward to the discussion. Perfect, perfect. San Carlen, Okoda Kusunkeso, AI, Yulie, Yulihak, AI, Yulihak, Yulihak, Yan, Chemoro, Baltor, Epsisuda, the uh, I'm very honored to have been invited here. Um, I also feel uh, guilty uh, because what I will be doing is um, destruct your enthusiasm about ethical codes. I hope also that in the end I might help to regain a little confidence in ethical codes again. As the title suggests, I make a difference between morals and ethics. By morals, I'm referring to the way people actually behave when the question is what is right and what is wrong. And by ethics, I refer to theoretical discussions, philosophical discussions about what should be right and what should be wrong. I will come back to this difference. Next slide, please. Artificial intelligence is often referenced to Pandora's box. Um, it might be useful to have a closer look at this moral story. In uh, Greek mythology, it was Prometheus who stole the fire from the gods. And the gods, particularly Zeus, were very angry about that and punished Prometheus by fixing him to a rock and have an eagle nibbling at his liver. Not only that, they were still very angry, the gods, and they created a woman, uh, seductively beautiful, but with all the negative adjectives, mischievous, foolish, and send it together with a box that was not supposed to be opened to Prometheus' brother. Prometheus' brother had been warned not to accept presents from the gods, but he feared that the same thing that had happened to his brother would also happen to him. So he accepted the present, he accepted Pandora, and Pandora eventually opened the box and all evil befell mankind. Now, uh, this is a rather misogynic uh, kind of story. Uh, it's not about a bear who is patiently for a hundred days in a cave eating garlic and vegetables and comes out as a woman. Uh, no, uh, this is a different story. Uh, by the way, um, uh, the core element of being misogynic is of course still true today when you have read, for instance, Mrs. Kim's book, Born 1982, here in Korea. But also research has revealed that this myth is a fake myth. Originally, uh, the myth Pandora, as the name says, 
uh, the all giver, was referring to Gaia, to Mother Earth, that gives the good as well as the bad to mankind. The change of the story was supposed to legitimize the change of Greek society from a matriarchic society to a patriarchic society. Why this moral story? Well, it shows that behind moral stories and moral attempts, there are very often political, political motives to legitimize power or to legitimize um, change in power. Next slide, please. The classical example of a ethical code is, of course, the Hippocratic oath. Uh, to an extent that uh, one researcher, Anna Fry, uh, in the UK, uh, suggested, quote, mathematicians, computer engineers, and scientists in related fields should take a Hippocratic oath to protect the public from powerful new technologies under development in laboratory, laboratories and in tech firms, unquote. Uh, well, one might ask what are uh, related fields uh, in uh, this context. There's also an empirical side to the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, in a study uh, uh, published in uh, 2011, for instance, uh, in the Archives of Internal Medicine, 80% uh, of practicing physicians reported participating in an oath ceremony, but they did not feel that this had influenced uh, their practice. And uh, furthermore, another story show, uh, 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 another research showed that barely half of US medical schools used any form of the Hippocratic Oath, and only 2% used the original, um, maybe because it contained a strong uh, condemnation of abortion. Now, what does this tell us? Uh, professional codes have, if at all, maybe two functions. To keep control over the profession, in particular uh, with regard to access. And secondly, to insulate the profession against criticism from outside and fear about uh, the knowledge the profession uh, seems uh, to uh, next slide. Uh, what you what you see here um, is uh, oh, it's a map by a, um, a Japanese. Uh, Woodpen maker from the middle of the 19th uh, century, uh, showing uh, the precarious path to um, a moral and good life. You have to avoid, uh, uh, for instance, uh, dangerous sites like uh, adultery or uh, the sea of desire. So why I'm showing this map? It shows temptations. And ethical codes tell us very little about the temptations that await us. They give no guidance what kind of temptations will be coming, and they give no guidance how to handle those temptations. Next slide. What ethical codes also do not do is to tell us what to do in a situation where you have conflicts of ethical codes. Loyalty to your country, uh, observing a, a secrecy pledge you have given your company on the one side, and on the other side, 
that there is something which you feel you have to share with mankind because you feel it is so dangerous. Next slide. What is also lacking in codes is a sort of institutionalizing of advice where to turn to when, for instance, there is a conflict, where to turn to, for example, when you have to face temptations. In the West, at least, the individual is left alone with ethical questions, with ethical problems. Next slide, please. Uh, initially, I've uh, pointed out the difference between what I see, morals on the one side, and ethics on the other side. I feel it is that with this plethora of ethical codes on the one side, which has been analyzed so expertly by our colleagues before, there is a lack, uh, a surprising lack, of empirical studies how those people actually behave in situations the codes are meant for. There are not, I feel, enough empirical studies about the reality of moral behavior. Next slide, please. Uh, I love these uh, simple slides that explain uh, everything, uh, just in one uh, image. Um, yeah, since uh, we are here in a law school, uh, and um, uh, since I'm now in an age where in the Seoul metro uh, I'm addressed as Opa and uh, the, the specially designed seat is made free for me in the metro, I can look back uh, to the beginning of the internet and the discussions we had about internet technology and its impact. And what I remember from those times was that there was a lot of discussion about regulations, about what law can do. Uh, not always with the uh, result that law should intervene, but there was a very strong legal debate. What I see now is the focus is on ethics. Uh, there is very little or relatively little a legal uh, debate about it the issues that law is being faced with, maybe it's just too uh, difficult. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, let me sum up. What are the seven deadly sins, so to speak, of ethical codes? Next slide, please. Well, they have an unreflecting attitude power, I feel. They mainly insulate against distrust. They neglect the temptations. They shy away from actual conflicts between elements of codes. They lack trusted sources of advice or institutions of advice. We are left with a lack of sufficient empirical studies in view of these codes, and there seems to be no or little trust in law. So what we need now, next slide please, I think, is to think about tools with which we can maybe improve or better criticize in a positive way ethical codes. Next slide please. So what I suggest is uh, a set of critical questions to be posed with regard to these codes. Uh, do they know how people actually behave? Uh, is there a discussion about who made them, for whom they are made, and why they are made just now? What are the social, political, and cultural implications? Do they realize the context in which they operate? Is there any guidance about temptations? Is there any institution you can turn to for advice? And is there sufficient discussion why 
there is no in-depth legal discussion. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your patience. Amuro는 AI 관시 AI의 발전이 그러니까 AI 자체에 대한 윤리라고 보자고 AI가 원래 우리가 가지고 있었던 여러 가지 가치관에 어떤 영향을 주는지 그리고 영향을 주기 때문에 그것을 다시 어떻게 AI를 이용하는 데 있어서요 그 규범 을 만드는 데 영향을 주는지에 대해서 어, 마르셀로 탐슨 홍콩대학교 법대 교수님께서 어, 발표를 해주시겠습니다. 네. Okay, alright. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure uh, to be in Seoul. Uh, uh, it's a very exciting city, a very exciting uh, event, uh, and I hope my presentation will uh, uh, shed some light here on. Uh, what I believe is a very important uh, question. Uh, so I pose it as a question, not as a solution. Though I'm, I'm putting forward what I believe as a, a, to be a solution, I don't like to, to have this as a conversation, and, uh, and this is something that can be uh, will be carried uh, uh, on uh, to the uh, following section, right? Uh, on uh, uh, the discussions uh, on, on on the topics uh, of this morning. So. Uh, the issue we'll be addressing here uh, is an issue uh, concerning the responsibilities or the liabilities uh, of platforms, the liability of designers uh, of artificial intelligent uh, technologies. Right? So is there a common thread? Is there a unifying uh, 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 theme uh, when we talk about the liabilities of, or uh, responsibilities of platforms? Uh, and the responsibilities of designers uh, of technological artifacts. Uh, and I believe there is a common theme. I believe there is a, a, a guiding thread here, as we're talking about uh, uh, Greek mythology, uh, and Ariadne's thread, uh, if, if, if you may, right? That uh, will lead us, uh, that may lead us out of the uh, labyrinth, labyrinth of the maze. Right? Uh, and this unifying theme uh, is the idea of effort. So what I'll be putting forward here is, is an argument uh, uh, in favor uh, of uh, when we talk about the liabilities of designers, when we talk about the liabilities uh, of platforms, the focus being uh, rather than on the outcomes uh, of what the platform may do or what an artificial, uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence system may cause, uh, the focus should be on the effort. Right? Uh, that has been put into uh, the development, into the design uh, of that technology. So, is this the way we have been approaching the problem of liability so far? Have we been focusing on efforts? Have we been uh, questioning what the efforts a certain platform uh, has been put into uh, 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 how it makes the decisions uh, uh, it makes about whether a certain content should be online uh, or not. So what has been the common approach? Uh, what has been the common approach is uh, an approach that we may call uh, an outcomes-based approach. Uh, outcomes-based liability regimes. Uh, why outcomes-based? They focus rather than on the, on the effort that the platform uh, dedicates to evaluating the content. Those regimes focus uh, on the outcome, on, on what may happen. So if a certain platform has not taken a content uh, down, right, a content that is harmful, uh, and there has been harm, right, and, and, and that uh, uh, is also an illegal content, would the platform respond? Right? The focus has been on whether the platform has taken down uh, and, and should take the content down, or whether the platform shouldn't respond at all. So on one hand, we have approaches uh, like, uh, next. like the, the approach we find in the US uh, or that we find in Brazil, an approach that was pioneered by the Communications Decency Act in 1996 and is a part of the Marco Civil, uh, which was the first Internet Bill of Rights, uh, which is the law uh, uh, that regulates the topic in, in, in Brazil. Uh, uh, it's a pioneer uh, uh, law. 
uh, the approach has been an approach uh, of uh, preserving, of fostering freedom of expression, which of course is a very laudable goal, right? We should of course preserve uh, freedom of, of expression. Uh, but this has uh, been uh, uh, at the expense of other values, like privacy or reputation. So what, the, what does the law uh, uh, in the US uh, do? The law will say that uh, the, the platform doesn't respond at all. Uh, the provider of an information service doesn't respond at all for the content uh, uh, it, 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 it hosts. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the intermediary knows, it doesn't matter uh, whether the intermediary makes any efforts towards taking the content down, even if the intermediary knows, the, the platform knows, if it, even if the platform doesn't do anything about the content, right, the platform will be exempt from liability. Right? So this is a, 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 an exception, right, an exception uh, uh, of liability that the platform benefits from. So this is an outcomes-based regime. Why is it, uh, it outcomes-based? Uh, of course, the focus is not uh, uh, here. The focus is not, let me just walk in. The focus is not on the weighting. It's not on the uh, evaluation by the platform of the content that it is hosting, right? The focus is on protecting a certain outcome. Uh, and the outcome here uh, is to preserve uh, freedom of expression, right? Uh, so this is one kind of regime. Right? Which is the regime we find in US, which is the regime uh, we find in Brazil. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and this creates, uh, next slide, this creates kinds of leviathans, very powerful actors. It makes platforms into very powerful actors. Because platforms won't suffer any consequence, right? They become free to design to, uh, their platforms in whatever way they may want. Right? So they are like the leviathans, they are the governors. Uh, uh, of the information environment. Next slide, please. Uh, on the other hand, we have regimes like the regime in Europe. Uh, what is the regime in Europe? The regime in Europe focus on a, focuses on another outcome. And what is the outcome? Right? The outcome is the following. Uh, whenever the platform acquires knowledge that it is hosting certain content, Right? Uh, the platform needs to take the content down expeditiously. And if the pla platform doesn't do so, right, the platform responds. Now, it doesn't matter whether the platform makes uh, 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 every reasonable effort to evaluate the content. It doesn't matter whether the platform has hired the most expensive lawyers, right, and has really uh, applied itself towards evaluate, uh, uh, evaluating the content. It doesn't matter. What matters is, if at the end of the day the content is, is found to be illegal by the court and the platform has, hasn't taken it down, right, the platform will respond. It doesn't matter if it's a very borderline situation. It doesn't matter if it's very difficult to decide on a certain matter, right, it's, if it's a moral question. It doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome. The platform didn't take the content down, the platform responds. So, you see, uh, in the US what matters is the outcome. Right? The platform can keep the content online. We, we preserve freedom of expression. In Europe, it's also the outcome, right? but the opposite. Uh, it's, uh, you preserve a reputation, privacy, and the outcome uh, 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 is then that the platform, platform just take the content down. Right? And the consequence has been that. The consequence of this regime has been a chilling effect. Right? Research shows uh, that platforms will just tend to take the content down. Is there then an alternative to that? Is there an alternative avenue for us to address the problem of platform liability? And I believe that is, and, and, and it, this is something that I... Uh, uh, can, can just... two, two uh, more. We can just wait. Okay? Uh, what, what, I'll put, what I put forward here is an efforts-based uh, uh, liability regime. Next one. The focus then here is uh, on the normative attitude, on the attitude, right, uh, that the platform uh, 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 adopts in relation to the content, in relation to evaluating the content, in, in, in relation to uh, uh, attending to the normative questions. And the, uh, and, and the issue here becomes then not whether the platform has taken it down or not, right? What matters is the weighing process. What matters is the, the reflective attitude that has been dedicated by the platform, 
right, towards the conflict. Next slide. Uh, so what I'm putting forward here uh, is what I call a reasonable efforts approach, right? What, what I have... Uh, next one. Uh, and this approach will focus on whether the, the platform has applied efforts which were reasonable, right? The best uh, efforts which were reasonable in, in those circumstances, right? Whether the platform has done that, right? Uh, you no, know, is this a liability regime? It can be a liability regime, but it's at the, at the same time a liability regime that won't focus on whether the platform was right or the platform was wrong. The platform, uh, C, doesn't respond for being wrong. The platform responds for not uh, uh, taking reasonable uh, uh, steps uh, in relation to the evaluation of the conflict. Right? So it may be that the platform right, hires the best lawyers, it may be that the platform makes uh, very substantial efforts and at the end of the day the platform is still wrong. Should the platform respond? Huh? Then the, the question uh, uh, is, has the platform uh, made uh, 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 efforts which are reasonable in the assessment of that form? Right? Uh, and, and if so, the platform shouldn't respond. No, a system like that creates a cushioning system for mistakes which are honest, mistakes which are uh, 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 an accident, right? But that the platform tried its best to uh, avoid, right? Uh, 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 something that the platform tried its best to avert. Uh, next slide. A system like this also creates wider possibilities for sanctioning. It's not purely a system of compensation, right? It doesn't need to be purely a system of compensation. It can be a system uh, uh, overseen by a regulator that will issue fines, right? But may also uh, 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 try to foster a certain kind of, of practice, may issue codes of practice, right? Uh, may encourage the development of technology, so may provide incentives, right? Uh, so a system that is not a purely and simply a system of compensation. Right? And this is a system then founded on a, a, a normative idea of negligence. An idea of negligence that doesn't focus only right, on whether the platform has been negligent in taking the content down or in keeping it online. Right? Uh, the negligence here is not in relation to the outcome. The negligence is in relation to the effort, to the normative effort adopted by the platform. Right? So it's a normative <coughs> idea of negligence. Right? Not a purely objective idea of negligence that focuses on the taking down process the takedown process, it's a normative idea of negligence that focuses on the normative attitude of the platform in evaluating the content right, in relation to uh, uh, the normative order uh, as a whole. Right? And it, it, it requires from the platforms a commitment of normative integrity, a commitment uh, 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 in relation to the norms, uh, uh, seeing to it that the platform right, appro approaches this normative question uh, in the, in the uh, uh, best way uh, uh, that is reasonable in, in, the, in, in uh, the circumstances. I can jump a few slides. Uh, you can, uh, uh, this was just quotes from the paper that I'll just uh, skip. Uh, so a final point here, right, uh, is that uh, we also need to understand that platforms vary, right? You have platforms like Google, which are very uh, well equipped to deal with challenging questions. And you have startups, right? Startups that uh, 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 will find it more challenge, more challenging to address these normative questions, to uh, undertake this normative uh, commitment uh, of evaluating content, sometimes in borderline situations, sometimes in very difficult situations. Right? And what the beauty of a system like this is that it, it scales. You can vary the kind of responsibility that the platforms may have in accordance with the economic and technological possibilities uh, of the platform, right? Uh, AI could be a, a, a factor here. Certain companies may have much uh, broader possibilities of adopting uh, AI in identifying a, a, a content, right? And in fact, uh, YouTube, for instance, does that in relation to a copyrighted content, right? But for a startup, it's very difficult to do that, right? So the system needs to take that uh, 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 into account. So this is what I have been putting forward in my research for the past uh, uh, 10 years, 
But if there is no wiring or connective tissue between principles and codes on the one hand, and motivation and behavioral change on the other, the plethora of values and aspirations codified in the Berkman visualization would remain inert, academic, and dissonant from the lived realities of most of the world. It is only through unpacking these principles, weighing them against the social and cultural context that they will be embedded in, and noting the gaps from principle to practice, sometimes enormous gaps, that we will begin to appreciate their potential real-world impact. I, for one, very much look forward to the sequel that I anticipate to this Berkman paper, which I have mentally titled, When the Rubber Hits the Ethics Road. So I wanted to share three very quick observations in relation to the panelists that you just heard, even though I couldn't hear them. One is this idea that the map is not the territory. This formulation, which is very popular in therapy circles in particular, comes from Alfred Korbich's 1933 work, Science and Sanity, an introduction to non-Aristotelian systems and general semantics. It refers to the gap between perception and reality. I refer to it here in this context of AI ethics for two reasons. One is to highlight the gap between codes and the reality of their adoption, but also to suggest a provocation and a thought experiment for this audience. Our mental maps are not as obvious as a printed map, a road map, for those of us who still use them to navigate, or Google Maps, or Naver, or Waze, for those who don't. Because we use our mental maps to think our thoughts and to feel our feelings. In Korzybski's words, we easily confuse maps with the territory. And in this instance, we could mistake ethics codes for the reality of how the world works. But here is the thing our brains aim to please. Left to their own devices, our brains will accept whatever maps we give them and will use them again and again. This is kind of like if someone moved from Seoul to Singapore but continued to use the Seoul map because she was familiar with it and liked it better than the Singapore map. Therapists care about the emotional equivalent of this analogy when our mental models don't adapt to reality. And worse, when we don't even realize that we're using a map at all. But here's the provocation and the thought experiment. If we think of ethical principles and codes, the types of things that Jessica described, if we think of these codes and principles as maps, could we see them as ways to actually overcome the gap between aspiration and behavior? If these principles and aspirations which are encoded in these documents, however well or poorly intentioned, could they actually serve as a way to orient people towards living with artificial intelligence? Rather than seeing them as opportunistic public relations exercises, or ways to avoid liability? Could they actually play a role in mainstreaming and disseminating values? Through repetition of these principles, codes, and values, could we hack the current wisdom that ethics are expensive, that they are compliance burden, and that human rights always hamper innovation? Could we retell these stories and share these maps, these mental models, these new guidelines, and actually improve the territory and improve the world that we live in. Um, the second point I wanted to make is the power of exceptions. I'm a lawyer, I'm always more curious about exceptions than rules, and points of deviance rather than compliance. Yes, I know that actually sounds like I'm more the criminal than the lawyer, but, but stick with me. I was struck by what the Bergman paper refers to in one instance, as the boldest departures from the standard notice and consent model, the description of the Chinese white paper on AI standardization and Indian AI strategy. The paper describes the acquisition and informed consent of personal data in the context of AI is something that should be redefined according to the Chinese document. Um, among other recommendations, it states that we should begin regulating the use of AI, which could possibly be used to derive information which exceeds what citizens initially consented to be disclosed. 
and in the Indian national strategy, there is a caution against unknowing consent uh, and a recommendation that mass education and awareness campaigns are a necessary component of implementing a consent principle in India. These two are highlighted as deviations from the kind of standard wording and standard ways of seeing the world that all of the other principles represent. And I'm actually very fascinated by what these two points of departure reveal about cultural context and about the penumbra of consent, the background that we don't necessarily think about when we just look at rules and the ways that these principles are described in ethical codes and practices. These are highly specific attributes of these particular societies, such as information asymmetries, digital illiteracies, and power imbalances. It's possible to be highly cynical about the Chinese or the Indian principles, given that these are contexts in which consent can often be meaningless, where it can be forced, where it can be obtained through duress, or through conditions of great poverty and desperation. But I think enshrining them in principles might actually be the first step towards eventual accountability. When that accountability is to the two largest populations on the planet, perhaps it's even more important that these principles work in tandem with enforceable legal and regulatory means to actually operationalize them. By recognizing that these principles function in slightly different contexts than the rest of the world, um, that recognition is actually very essential towards eventually achieving transparency and accountability and towards actually solving these problems that these deviations hint at, the problems of asymmetry, the problems of exceed, exceeding what is initially consented to, the problems of scope creep. So I think deviations actually reveal more than convergence. And I think this is something that I find very fascinating about studies like the Bookman paper, which actually brings me to my final observation. In a very thought-provoking piece in the MIT newsletter, which was titled, How Not to Teach Ethics, Professor Susan Sibley, who's the faculty chair, challenges the stories that we tell about ethics. And I think in coming back to stories, I'm keeping in the spirit of what Herbert talked about, about the stories we tell and the different stories that the same principle might enshrine and the ways in which one story can be replaced by another, and how the stories that we tell might reveal or hide certain things about societies, about patriarchy giving way to matriarchy, for example. Um, in this paper, Susan simply outlines the recent push to force ethics into the curriculum of engineering and science schools following the increasing crises of corporate and professional responsibility. Such courses are emerging, as we all have experienced, at a moment when big tech companies have been struggling to handle the side effects of Silicon Valley's build it first mindset. Professor simply critiques the fact that most of these courses focus on getting students to reflect on their very personal choices. Um, she writes, this cycle of scandal and the responsive calls for better training has often been repeated and one can only be surprised by the paucity of models for providing this kind of education. The standard model required in law and medical schools, which is now leaking into engineering and computer science programs with minor variations, teaches ethics as problems in individual decision-making, personal values, and choices. The training focuses on very formalized rules of professional conduct, punctuated by appeals for social responsibility. It has not proved to be a successful regime if the repeated cycles of corporate and professional misconduct are any gauge. Such standard models, she says, fail because the diagnosis and cure share a basic misconception that corporate and professional misconduct are problems caused by rotten apples some few weak, uninformed, or even misguided individuals making independently poor choices. She goes on to describe how even massive lapses 
like the ones at Android or Cambridge Analytica, are narrated as the story of a few rotten apples giving the barrel a bad name. She asks, if we talk about ethics as individual decision making without history, context, social structure and culture, we have not explained how the organization of apples in the barrel is part of why we see only an occasional bad apple and how those bad apples can infect other apples. What are the mechanisms of infection and spread? This is the missing structural element that conventional accounts of ethics as bad apples usually miss and an alternative approach to ethical education and responsibility might offer. And you should read the entire article because it's a really instructive one. It's available online and I can share it with the conference organizers through KS Park. But I offer this provocation as a way of tying together the seven deadly sins that Herbert outlined, as well as the questions that he posed at the end, particularly to link individual decision making to aggregated moral culture. Um, and more importantly, to structural factors such as incentives, taxes, institutional corruption, government bailouts, etc. Seeing ethics as more than a matter of individual morality, of individual decisions that a few in uninformed or badly informed people make, that some ethical bad apples make, to see it as more than a matter of individual morality and as something that is institutional, that is either enabled, bolstered, or actually made possible by institutional and structural factors is something that I think cuts through the first session. And I think it's the reason why we need to tell very different stories about ethics. Um, so I hope these three points that I leave you with um, are helpful and I very much look forward to the rest of this event. If I can hear you, thank you so much. Thank you, we'll, we'll try to send you uh, uh, snippets and uh, summaries of uh, our uh, events. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. <웃음> 네, 그러면 어, 다음 토론자로 어, 이상우 어, 한양대학교 철학과 교수님의 토론이 있겠습니다. 어, 앞에서 하시죠. Uh, because uh, it's important to have uh, uh, exact uh, time uh, map for the lunch, uh, I think uh, I should just start. And uh, why you are coming? I think you, you are invited to come because uh, we can.
많이 겹치고 주요 단어도 뭐 accountability, transparency, 그 다음에 human rights 이런 여러 가지 것들이 많이 겹치고 그런 사람들이 어떻게 생각하기 쉽냐면 아 그러니까 AI 일이라는 거는 그냥 우리, 우리말로 그냥 착하게 살면 되는구나 그냥 나쁘지도 않고 그냥 사람들이 생각하기에 윤리적으로 굉장히 이렇게 당연한 것들을 잘 지키면 되지 거기에 대해서 이렇게 고민할 이유가 별로 없는 거구나 라고 생각하기 쉬운데 사실은 그렇지 않고 사실은 그렇지 않은 이유를 제가 우리 국회아르트 교수님께서 잘 지적을 해주셨는데 왜 그러냐면 실제 AI와 관련해서 우리가 가지게 되는 사회적 쟁점이나 정치적 쟁점, 제도적 쟁점, 법적 쟁점들은 그 내부에서 그런 추상적인 수준의 그 우리가 쉽게 동의할 수 있는 윤리적 원칙들이 충돌하는 경우가 굉장히 많습니다. 그리고 어떤 경우에는 그 원칙이 지켜졌는지 지켜지지 않았는지 자체를 판단하기가 쉽지 않은 경우가 많습니다. 구체적인 예를 들어 보겠습니다. 제가 사실 유네스코에서 AI 유리 관련된 논의에 참여하면서 실제 있었던 부분인데요. 어, 어, 우리나라에서 특히 이제 그 민감한 그 가짜 뉴스라고 흔히 얘기하는 미스인포메이션, 그 디스인포메이션 이런 얘기들과 관련해서 말씀을 드리면 어, 실제로 유럽의 몇몇 국가에서는 이 디스인포메이션 문제가 그냥 추상적으로 문제가 됐던 게 아니라 AI를 활용하거나 아니면 어차피 여러 가지 프로그램을 사용해서 어, 디스인포메이션을 많이 퍼뜨려서 어, 선거 결과가 완전히 뒤바뀐 사례들이 꽤 있습니다. 그래서 유럽적 참가 그, 그, 그 예네스코 의미에서 유럽 쪽에서 참가했던 학자분들은 굉장히 강하게 어, 이 디스인포메이션에 대해서 강력한 규제들을 해야 된다. 어, 그렇지 않으면 사실은 어, 그 민주주의 자체가 위협을 하는 말까지 이건 분명히 중요한 가치죠. 우리가 올바른 정보들을 전달받고 네, 그것에 맞춰서 그 민주주의적 가치를 지켜야 합니다. 그런데 문제는 뭐냐면 어, 그런 직관적으로 너무나 타당해 보이는 디스 인포메이션에 대한 강력한 규제는 다른 측면에서 보면 사실은 어, 개, 개개인들이 개개인들이 자신의 양심에 따라서 자신이 어, 추구하는 어떤 가치들을 반영해서 정치적 결정을 내리는데 제한을 줄수 있다는 겁니다. 어, 그러니까 사실 원래 그 존스 조트 미리 제안한 자유주의적 어, 정치 철학에 따르면 모든 개개인은 어, 어, 어떤 경우에는 자기가 반대하는 입장까지 굉장히 적극적으로 찾아다니면서 귀 기울여서 듣고 그것들을 이렇게 포괄적으로 고려한 다음에 어, 자신의 입장들을 어, 정해야 되는 그런 어떤, 어, 어떤 도덕적 생물할까요? 어, 그런 것들까지 가지고 있는데 그런 상황에서 너는 이 정보는 디스인포메이션과 듣지마 그 다음에 너는 이 정보는 왜곡될 수 있으니까 발표하지마 라는 식으로 어, 정부가 아니면 그 권력 부관에서 어, 지나치게 간섭을 하다 보면 어, 실제로 그런 어, 개인의 자유로운 선택권 어, 어떻게 민주주의 근간이라고 말씀 다른 어떤 원리들을 어, 손상하게 됩니다. 네, 결국은 그렇게 이제 그러니까 그럼 이제 어느 수준에서는 규제를 하고 어느 수준에서 규제를 하지 말아야 되냐는 결정해야 되는데 사실 이게 정말로 아까 국가를 교수님 말씀하셨듯 이게 정말로 어렵고 중요한 문제인 거죠. 왜냐하면 정확히 어떤 수준에서 어, 그 톰슨 교수님도 말씀하셨는데 리즈너블하게 에포스를 해야 된다고 얘기하는데 어, 정확히 어떤 수준에서 디스 인포메이션을 규제해야지 그게 어, 우리가 그 북한 교수님 말씀하신 모랄 수준에서 억셉트라는 것인가 수용 가능한 것인가 하는 점을 시연하게 고민을 어, 해봐야 합니다. 그런데 그런 논의들이 사실은 정말로 AI ES6, AI 윤리에 해당하는 어, 논의고 그런 논의들을 집중적으로 특히 그거는 당연한 편이지만 나라마다 아, 그 개인주의에 대한 직관, 그 다음에 개인의 인권에 대한 직관이 조금씩 다를 수 있기 때문에 물론 보편적인 공통적인 가치들은 분명히 존재하지만 그런 것들을 고려해서 아주 구체적으로 제도적 수준에서 법적 수준에서 어, 이루어져야 되고 그것이 모두 다 AI s x 라는 어, 이름에 포괄되어야 되는데 어, 일반 사람들이 AI 윤리 이렇게 생각하면 아주 추상적인 윤리 원칙들 이렇게 나열하는 거 어느 정도 이제 끝난다고 생각하는 대학이 있는데요. 오늘 또첫 번째 세션에서 어, 그것이 아니라 실제로 정말 중요하고 정말 우리가 관심을 기울여야 될 AI, AI, AI 인공지능 윤리의 어, 쟁점들은 그런 부, 어, 부채적인 디테일이 있다라고 어, 하는 것들을 어, 잘 이해할 수 있었다고 생각합니다. 그런 점에서 굉장히 중요한 어, 그 세션이었다고 생각합니다. 한 가지 제가 궁금한 건 지금 필드 교수님 그 연구하신 거에서 궁금한 건데 그런 그 중심적인 그 어, 키워드들 말고 실제 그
그런 컴플릭트들, 그 키워드 사이의 컴플릭트들 어, 에 대한 논의들이 그 조사하시고 그런 여러 가지 보고서나 문서 얼마나 등장을 했는가 그런 것들을 어떤 방식으로 어, 그, 해결하려고 노력하고 있는가 하는 점들을 좀 말씀해 주시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 네, 다음으로는 어, 카카오의 최영필 연구위원님의 말씀입니다. 네, 안녕하세요. 카카오에서 전송한 최영필입니다. 우선 이, 이 뜻깊은 행동 주제에 주신 주제에 감사를 드리고요. 그 AI 원칙에 대한 방대한 그 연구 결과를 좀 해주셔, 해주신 제스카 페이블입니다. 네, 그리고 프로젝트를 위해 프로젝트를 위해 감사를 드립니다. 굉장히 중요하고 우리가 좀 고민하고 궁금해하는 신경의 내용들을 굉장히 체계화시켜서 그런 사안의 감량을 잘 보여주신 것 같습니다. 그리고 하버트, 하버트 법학 교수님께서 발표해주신 AI 윤리에 대한 프레임과 실질적인 질문을 굉장히 흥미로운 부분이었고 말씀은 통생 교수님이 발표해주셨던 어떤 플랫폼이 설계와 책임과 관련해서 과정의 중요성 그리고 합리적인 노력에 적극법을 말씀해주신 내용은 역시 어떤 어, 새로운 프레임으로 상황을 바라볼 수 있는 방향을 찾아주신 것 같아서 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 우선 어, 다른 기술들과 마찬가지로 AI, AI라는 기술이 사람으로부터 시작해서 사람으로 마무리되는 것이라고 생각을 합니다. 결국 기술을 개발하고 제품과 서비스를 완성시키는 것들이 사람에 의해서 이루어지고 그 기술을 이용하는 대상 역시 어, 사람이기 때문에 어떤 AI로 인한 그런 변화 과정이 우리 모두가 있는 사회의 영향을 되는 것이라고 생각을 합니다. 결국 이 지금의 소위가 저희가 AI 시대라고 하는데요. 이 사회를 살아가는 어떤 모든 구성원들이 어떻게 보면 기존과는 다른 어떤 변화의 소용돌이 속에서 어떤 사회의 어떤 기본적인 원칙과 규범을 지킬 수 있을지 좀 고민을 해봐야 할것 같습니다. 현재 AI로 인한 앞에서 많이 말씀을 해주는 어떤 다양한 현상들이 전 세계에서 발생을 하고 있고 특히나 저희 같은 기업들 뿐만이 아니라 다양한 각계 각층에서 어떤 이슈를 마주하고 해결점을 찾기 위해서 많이 노력을 하고 계신 것 같습니다. 사실 특히나 기업들 입장에서는 그 어떤 사회적 역할과 책임에 대해서 많은 질문들을 받고 있는데요. 예, 항상 저희도 염두에 두긴 하지만 어떤 이러한 현상은 그 기술과 서비스를 개발하는 개발하고 사용하는 개인으로부터 시작이 된다고 생각합니다. 그리고 이 기술에서부터 개인으로부터 시작해서 서비스와 제품, 그리고 플랫폼으로 확장되는 관계를 거쳐서 어떻게 보면 최종적으로는 개인과 기업들이 속한 사회로 확장되는 관계를 거치는 것이 아닌가 생각을 합니다. 어, 어떤 이 사회에 소속된 구성원, 기업들에게는 AI와 관련된 어떤 사회적 책임을 다해야 한다는 조직 목소리가 높아지고 있는데요. 음, 이제 전 세계적으로 어떤 공통적으로 지적되고 있는 내용이 있습니다. 아까 앞에서 제시카 필드 교수님께서도 말씀을 해주셨지만 어떤 편향성에 대한 문제들, 그리고 데이터에 대한 인식들 아마 세션 2에서부터 자세하게 갖게 될것 같고요. 어떤 그 알고리즘이 통제가 불가능해지는 상황에 대한 대처, 그리고 그 투명성에 대한 것들이 좀 중요한 숙제 중 일부라고 생각합니다. 아무래도 제가 오늘 참석을 한 것은 기업 사이드에서 말씀을 좀 드려야 될것 같은데요. 그 많이들 좀 알고 계시기는 할것 같은데 어떤 기업의 입장에서 사회적 책임을 다하고 역할에 대해서 저희가 고민했던 얘기들을 좀 잠깐 말씀드리려고 합니다. 사실 그 카카오 윤리원장 얘기인데요. 이 내, 내용은 사실 국내외 자리에서 많이 언급되었던 부분이기도 하고 하지만 이게 좀 주제와 관련된 부분이기도 하고 처음 들으시는 분들도 계실 것 같아서 어떤 저희가 어떻게 노력하고 고민하고 있는지에 대해서 좀 간단히 말씀을 드리려고 합니다. 사실 워낙 아까 앞에서 말씀을 해주셨지만 다들 아시지만 카카오는 플랫폼 기업입니다. 어떤 플랫폼 기업으로서의 어떤 역할과 책임이 많이 강조되고 있는데요. 이런 좀 사회적으로 중요하게 이슈화되고 있는 서비스에 대해서는 뭐 알고리즘을 공개하고 좀 투명하게 설명을 하면서 어떤 저희들의 역할과 책무를 다하기 위해 노력을 하려고 합니다. 사실 그래서 어, 2017년 하반기부터 어떤 AI 윤리, 알고리즘 윤리에 대해서 내부적으로 많은 고민을 했습니다. 그래서 내부적으로 많은 논의들을 거쳤고 그렇다면 우리가 말할 수 있는 윤리라는 게 무엇일까라는 내용을 좀 정리를 해서 
어, 2018년 1월에 그 알고리즘 윤리현장을 발표를 했습니다. 알고리즘과 관련된 모든 노력을 우리 사회 윤리 안에서 다 하고 이를 통해서 인류 편의가 행복을 추구한다는 좀 원대한 주민 원칙을 시작해서 어떤 차별에 대한 경계, 데이터의 투명한 운영성, 어, 알고리즘의 독립성, 그 다음에 이용자와의 어떤 신뢰적, 신뢰관계를 구축하기 위한 좀 성실한 설명성에 대한 다섯 가지 조언을 포함해서 어, 발표를 했었습니다. 그리고 사실 이 윤리라는 거, 헌장이라는 게 어, 완성이라는 게 없고 끝이라는 게 없다고 저는 생각을 했고요. 그리고 처음 저희가 윤리헌장을 재정, 재정해서 발표했던 시간, 시간 이후에 한 1년 7개월 뒤에 작년 2019년 8월에 좀 국내에 좀 사회적으로 많은 논의들이 되고 이슈화 되고 있던 어떤 포용성이라는 목을 윤리현장에 추가를 했습니다. 어, 알고리즘 기반의 어떤 기술과 서비스가 사회 전반을 좀 포용하고 포용할 수 있도록 노력하겠다는 저희의 의지를 담아놨는데요. 이 부분은 좀 전체적으로 논의되고 있는 어떤 디지털 디바이드 현상에 대해서 어, 차별 없이 서비스를 이용하는 데 최선을 다하겠다는 저희의 의지, 의미를 좀 담은 프로젝트였습니다. 사실 기술이 발전하고 새로운 서비스가 나타나게 되면 저희가 지금 논의하고 있는 이 프레임으로 예상할 수 없는 다양한 현상들이 나타나게 될것 같습니다. 결국은 기술과 사회라는 것이 계속 살아있는 생명체 같은 것이라고 저는 생각이 되는데요. 일단 지금의 프레임으로 정의하고 끝나지 않고 이제 끊임없이 변화하는 현상에 대해서 고민하고 해결 방법을 좀 찾아야 할 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. 그래서 저희도 계속 좀 어떤 전 세계적인 움직임이나 국내 사회적 부분에 대해서 기술 기를 기울고 그런 것들을 좀 관여를 하고 어, 그런 보완이 필요한 부분들 그 다음에 변화해야 될 부분들에 대해서는 이제 저희 뿐만이 아니라 어떤 AI에 대해서 고민하는 모든 부분들이 필요한 것이 아닐까 생각이 듭니다. 어, 사실 이런 문제라는 것은 단순히 지금 이렇게 앉아있는 저희 뿐만이 아니라 여기 앉아계신 분들 혹은 여기 참석하지 않은 모든 분들이 좀 고민을, 고민을 해야 될 부분이라고 생각을 하고요. 그래서 오늘 이 자리에 각계, 각, 각고 각층에서 참석하셔서 일단 스터디하신 내용을 좀 공유하고 더 나은 방법들을 고민하고 어, 고민할 수 있는 자리를 만들어 주시면 안될것 같습니다. 사실 저희의 모든 고민들은 다 공통적이라고 생각합니다. 또 안전하고 평화로운 사회에 살아갈 수 있는 방법을 생각해본 어, 것이라고 생각을 하고요. 사실 지금 AI라는 것은 앞에서 잠깐 말씀드렸지만 뭐 기술을 개발하고 서비스를 내는 기업 혹은 학교에서 공부를 하고 계시는 교수님들, 연구진들 아주 이런, 이런 분들 뿐만이 아니라 모든 이 사회를 살아가는 모든 사람들이 고민해야 될 부분이라고 생각을 합니다. 이 시대를 살고 있고 기술을 사용하고 개발을 하는 서비스를 내어놓는 모든 사람들이 어떤 기본과 기본적 원칙을 기반으로 살아가야 될 것인지 고민되고 결국 거기서부터 어떤 사회를 만들어가는 어떤 사회를 만들어가는 것인지가 중요할 것 같습니다. 사실 지금 지금 저희가 살고 있고 앞으로 다가올 이 AI 시대라는 것이 지금까지 살아온 세상이랑 완전히 다른 모습, 모습이지만 음, 결국 사람이 살아가는 곳이라는 것을 감안을 한다면 어떤 인간사의 기본적인 원칙과 규범, 규범은 어, 이 사람의 흐름을 지켜갈 것이라고 생각을 합니다. 어, 사실 어, 저희는 한 명의 시민이 하고 어, 우리의 생각과 이런 행동들이 AI 시대에 많은 영향을 미치고 또 작용들을 이끌어낼 수가 있습니다. 저뿐만이 아니라 여기 계신 많은 분들이 그러시게 되실 것 같고요. 오늘 계속 고민을 하고 목소리를 내어주시고 더 완전한 솔루션을 찾을 수는 없지만 저 계속 고민하고 그런 해결 방법들을 찾아가면서 어, 더 좋은 사회를 만들어가기 위해서 노력을 해야 되지 않을까 생각이 듭니다. 감사합니다.